is right there. Hello, it's Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. Thank you for joining us whenever it is that you are joining us. Last week, we considered how our pride might get in the way of our, uh, of our willingness to pray and our, our uh, anxieties to pray. So today, we might consider further how you, uh, how you and I are disciplined by the Lord when we aren't humble before him so that we can come to him with humble hearts and, and trusting always in his mercy and his promises uh, to hear our prayer. And it will be always a, a very great hour of prayer when we pray to him in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And Amen. We get there. We're going to talk about that this morning. Anyone? Comments? The Lord loves to hear us pray. He really does. Now, when the Lord hides his face and we think our prayer has not been heard, what about then? Let's consider how to pray with humble hearts. And I should stop right there. What does it mean to pray to God with a heart that's humble? What's the opposite of humble? Prideful. That's what we have been talking about. Now we go to the positive side and bring him humble hearts that know that he is God and we are not that he deserves all honor, praise, glory, and dominion, and it is not ours to claim. And he alone is the Father. And then with faith, with the faith that he has given us, given us we're going to hang on to, we're going to hang on to the promises. And I know my heart, and I think yours is the same. We need a repetition of those promises in our ears and in our hearts to believe them, to believe them. So let's go on to the next slide. David experienced the hiding of God's face. And these are the two verses from Psalm 30 that he prayed. Would uh, Judy read that, please? As for me, I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face. I was dismayed. You hid your face. When God's face seems hidden. David says you hid your face. What is David really saying here? He turned away from me. He turned away. Good. It's an anthropomorphism. We're speaking of God as though he had a face. Now, David perceived this, but the problem was not with God, was it? It was with David and his pride. I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. I've got all these armies. I've got 1,400,000 men who can draw the sword, and I can defeat any enemy. That was the problem. And God hid his face, and David said, I was dismayed. What is David saying? Now, let's apply it to our lives and the way that we pray, okay? If the Lord seems to hide his face when we pray, if he seems to take away or not give his blessing, he doesn't give an immediate answer to our prayer. I have prayed all week for this. Oh, watch your impatience before God, people. <laughs> I don't think he appreciates your impatience. Your importunate prayer, your repeated prayer is not an offense to him. 
But in demanding from God or being disappointed in God, you are on the wrong side of the tracks, so to speak, spiritually. So when he hides his face from us, what is he doing? What is God he's doing? He's more humble. He's, what did you say, Evelyn? He's making us more humble. Yes, how does that happen? He's also telling us we can't have it both ways. We can't have our cake and eat it too. <laughs> I sometimes think he's also drawing us closer to him. Um, in that um, because we don't get it instantly and we probably get the blessing and then forget about it. This way, um, you know, he's reminding us to uh, probably it might get us back in the word to, uh, to uh, keep praying. All right. Here's a possible answer. The Lord may be disciplining us or teaching us or correcting us, or even chastising us. It may seem painful for the moment, Hebrews chapter 12. So that's what I would like us to look at. Um, Evelyn, are you up to reading Proverbs 3? Right. It's right here. Okay. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, <laughs> or be wary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves, as a father, a son in whom he delights. There's the relationship that God has set up. The Lord God has enabled us through Christ to call us Father. More about that a little bit later. So you see the uh, proverb gets quoted in Hebrews chapter 12. Back to Judy. Now I'm going to click it because the verses come up one at a time. Go ahead, Judy. All okay. four, three verses, verses. Okay. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And, is, and it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Now, do you see the relationship to, to Proverbs 3? Mm -hmm. It is said that the letter to the Hebrews <coughs> is really a series of sermons with texts from the Old Testament. Okay, so next time you read Hebrews, remember we studied it about six years ago, eight years ago? <laughs> All right. Could consider how we pray. Let us look at our own prayers, um, not too analytically, but just consider how we come to God. Now, here's one way we could come to God. Uh, we could list all the good things that we have done when we begin our prayer to God. Now, what would that sound like? I'm being pride. A, uh, pride, yeah. What would it sound like? Can you give an example? I mean, I know you wouldn't pray like that, but what would it be like, for example? Well, I'm, I'm thinking of a prayer. Of, I don't know why Thanksgiving uh, popped into my head. If we list all the good things oh, we have done, in our prayers to God. Uh, there, the we is in there. That isn't, I would say, the good things God has done for us, we would give well, thanksgiving, I'm, but it's I'm, when we, I caught myself. All right, and, but now consider someone who would go to God and and say, God, I, I, I want to tell you how good I have been. I, uh, I have uh, done the laundry I have picked up outside and prepared the things that I need to prepare uh, for the things I want to get done. And um, I'm, um, I'm keeping the law really pretty good. Now, what would that sound like in God's ears? <clears throat> we're, we're back to pride, aren't we? Yeah, I would say it's back to the I, I, I. 
I don't think you pray like that. But there are some people in the world who want to list their righteous deeds in order to gain uh, some kind of uh, opening in God's ears. Is that going to work? You think so? They may be trying to repent. Well, they're not listing the bad things they've done. They're listing the good things they have done. It's just, that's just big pride, and God is not impressed with what you have done. We'll quote Jesus uh, in the parable, the, the servants say when the master comes home, we have only done what we ought to have done. Well, don't we know, too, the, the chastising of the Pharisee, praying out loud, loudly at the temple to... Uh, yes, to, that is uh, a good example. Thank you, Judy. Mm -hmm. what, did, what did he pray? I thank you that I am not like this yes. publican. Yes. And then he listed that he fasted twice a week, and he gave a tithe of all that he had. Mm -hmm. I'm so good. I'm a Pharisee. We have to be careful that we don't do that. Well, if we did make a list like that, would any of those things induce God to answer or to be quick with his answer or even to hear our prayer? Oh, no, no, no. No, I, I'm, maybe this is a, a trivial example. So I want to use that extreme in order to contrast the approach that we come to God with a humble heart. Consider how we pray. The scriptures teach us to come to God with a humble heart. And the posture is not, I keep saying this because there are people who insist on a certain posture. And I know that in the scriptures, people are described as having various postures. We'll look at one of them a little bit later. But you don't have to kneel to pray. Is your heart kneeling? For some people, their, their physical position in, puts in <clears throat> them in a mood to pray. And they, they kneel when they pray, and that's fine. All right? But the humble posture is described by St. Paul. Evelyn, would you read this? For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? You have anything that you made yourself that you didn't uh, get from God? Do you have any spiritual gifts that you made yourself? in the workroom of your mind. What do you have that you did not receive? People like to boast of what they have in, <coughs> in uh, attainments, accomplishments, uh, purchases. Come and see what I have. There was an advertisement for a furniture company I know one of the locations of that furniture, furniture company on Okeechobee Boulevard. And the whole ad was a play on their words. When you have this, <laughs> do you remember the furniture company? I'm not trying to give them a commercial. I'm trying not to, because the whole commercial was built on covetousness. When you have this, your life will be better. Mm -hmm. That's one of the... I don't understand that that well. For he who sees anything different in you, I, I don't actually understand what that is saying. Maybe I'm missing the point. I know of this particular thing. I get the total point, but I don't know why it says it this way. Well, you ask a good question, and what I'm going to do is to find the context, the context, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, and um, this is how one should regard us. 
Paul is talking about <coughs> the men who were serving as missionaries and pastors and perhaps apostles. He doesn't bring them up. But this is how one, I'm be, beginning at the beginning of the chapter. So this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and servants of, of and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now the mysteries of God are several. The incarnation of Christ, the uh, Christ is God and man in one person. That uh, another mystery is that uh, the Gal the uh, not the Galatians, the Gentiles were included in the promise. It wasn't just the Jews who were to be saved. Under understand? Those are mysteries of God. The Holy Communion is one of the mysteries of God, and though it's not named as a mystery, uh, the uh, baptism is a mystery of God. So you should regard us as stewards, caretakers. They're not ours. We're stewards of these mysteries, and we teach them to the people. All right? That's just one verse. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Yeah. All right, in the teaching. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I, don't need, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation for God. Now he makes application. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, <coughs> brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If you then received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Now, thank you for your question. I think I've got the answer. The answer is, he gave it to you. So therefore, you shouldn't boast that you did it. He did it. And the it is the gift of the being a steward of the mysteries of God. Yes. Received. So it is a particular uh, boasting that he was uh, discussing, and evidently some among the Corinthians were boasting. Mm. Most of First Corinthians is putting putting away of certain errors that uh, other people were uh, having. So. That's why the letter was written. The letter was written in answer to two things. Things Paul had heard about them and things that they wrote about. They had questions of Paul who had started that church on his first trip through. So the, the, there's a history behind it. Okay, everybody? So don't boast about the things that you have, the spiritual gifts and responsibilities. You are a steward. And then this verse, uh, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Oh, there's a lot in that one sentence. Mm -hmm. Let's take the first thing about the boasting. Paul has nothing to boast about. I started this church and that church, and, and they, they named this church after me. Look, they put St. Paul over the doorway. None of that, none of that was going on. That happened later on when churches were named after uh, these men who God used. God used them to start his church, to spread his church, to spread the gospel. <coughs> And Paul says, I'm not going to boast of anything except the cross. What do you mean, boast of the cross? That is my glory. That is the thing that, that is the, 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 what brought me to God. 
that saved me, that forgave my sins, that put me in line uh, for the gift of heaven. I'm going to keep on, and by boasting it, he means, he means I'm going to keep on proclaiming that. That's of chief importance to me. Another time he said, woe to me if I preach not the gospel. A, a, a burden had been laid upon him. He had to do it. Well, we should have such energy to boast in the cross of Jesus. Now, the second part is another sermon, which I won't preach now, but I've been crucified. Uh, as far as the world's concerned, uh, I'm dead to the world. You understand? He's separating himself from the things that people glory in. Oh, our, 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 our nation and our people have gone so far away uh, from this. But I, I say we can't preach a sermon on every verse in scripture when we do a, a one hour Bible study. Now here's an example of humility that has never been exceeded and never will be exceeded. Judy, okay. uh, take a deep breath and I have um, three through uh, 11. So that is three from 12 is nine verses on two slides. You can read as much as you're willing. Uh, keep going. Go ahead. Okay. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equally with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And be found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of, the, of God the Father. Philippians 2, verses 3 to 11. This is humility mm. to the nth degree. Well, there is. There is. This is humility. Hi, Pastor Clem. I'm glad that you're here with us today. Okay. I find it interesting. This is the humility of Jesus, the one who has saved you. He humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of death, even death on the cross. And God gave him the name that is above every name. Concentrate on the word name there. So instead of hindrances to prayer, let's talk about the other side of going to God and talking to him. We're going to talk about God's constant invitation to pray with abundant promises to hear. This is what our hearts need most of all. The Lord loves to hear us pray. You see why I chose that title? Mm -hmm. The Lord loves to hear us pray. Even though we were straying like sheep, Isaiah 53 and 1 Peter 2.25, which quotes that passage, the shepherd called us, and by grace, we responded in faith. Does anybody remember what is uh, stored back there in Isaiah 53? It's coming. Isn't that what uh, the, the, I was in a Jewish synagogue one time and they left out Isaiah 53, is it seven? About the Messiah coming? That's exactly what it is. Uh, it is the 
the passage that predicts the suffering of Christ in the most exacting terms. And the prophet was given by God to see the crucifixion. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. When I was active, we used to read that every Good Friday. Every Good Friday, Isaiah 53. So Jesus taught us to pray, our Father. If you don't know what else to pray, if you can't think of the words to pray, the words that Jesus gave us are sufficient. Maybe not this time around, but another time I could teach a class where all of the things that we need to say to God are encapsulated in those seven petitions. It is a complete prayer. Study it one, one line, one clause at a time. Not today. Our Father, that's the, those are the two words I want us to look at for a couple of minutes here. Our Father. What does it mean to pray our Father? Look at both words. Pastor Clem has been praying our Father for over 80 years. And it's not worn out by repetition. Uh, do you want us to go into what we feel is description to those two words? Or? Yes. What does it mean to pray our Father? Uh, our to me is um, a possession uh, type of... I, it's it's like it's it's my it's my it's my dad and father means you know the head of the household um uh, as i've learned it right uh, who looks after who really looks after everyone in the household all right apply that to god now so it's like you know it's it's my daddy who looks after me yeah some people like to quote that passage where we call him abba Father, and the Abba has to do with a, a very close uh, relationship between father and children. All right. Our father. He is above us, but that, but, but now he's not just above us to, to lord it over us and to be the, the boss kind of God. He is for us. The father, as you said, Judy, who makes sure that we have everything we need. Everything. Our Father. Now, it's good for Lutherans to quote Martin Luther once in a while, don't you think? <laughs> okay. So this is what some of you were taught when you took catechism. What does it mean to pray our Father? And Luther says, God would by these words tenderly invite us to believe that he is our true father and that we are his true children so that we may ask him, oh, look at that word, confidently with all assurance as dear children ask their dear father. Now think of how children ages three, four, five, six, seven, how do they ask their father? Describe that relationship and, and how they ask. Well, lately it's I want. But yeah. I, I want you to go back to when uh, you were that age and uh, you came up to him in his easy chair behind his newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> And he took time out for you. Uh, Daddy, I would like. Uh -huh. Is it possible that I could have? Or, Probably was used. Or, or go for a sleepover or play out in the backyard for a while. Or you, you had a thousand, thousand requests, most of which were trivial 
but some were important. And, oh, uh, you know, the Hallmark movie is coming on, so I better, I better with, uh, restrain it. I was going to talk about the time when you were um, a, another decade older or two, and um, you wanted to tell him oh. there was a certain man in your life, and you wanted to be married. But I won't stay there. Yes. I, I won't stay there. I'm talking about the relationship we have by his grace and by his invitation through Jesus. The Father is inviting us to call him Father. Do you get it? And never forget those two words. It's not just an introduction like, I better name him so he'll know I'm talking to him. No. I'm being silly. He would tenderly invite us to believe this. So we are like thankful sheep. Prayer, someone said, I'm plagiarizing here from a booklet that I have. Prayer is the response of sheep bleating back to the shepherd our words of gratitude, affection, and dependence upon him for all we are and have. And that would be the thanksgiving part of your prayer or the praise part of your prayer. You can spend quite a bit of time just on those words of gratitude and affection and dependence. Prayer is the opportunity that God gives us to thank him for the daily gifts of his presence and his provision and his protection. Now think of those big words. Here we are. God's presence in our lives. God's provision in our lives. I love to talk about the providence of God. Oh, give me a year and I'll maybe exhaust it and his protection. Do you know how many evils there are in our part of the world? No, you don't. The arrows of the evil one are not reaching you because of his protection. And you think it is uh, the police and the army and the Navy and the Marines and the Air Force and the Space Force. You think they're giving you protection. God indeed uses those means to protect you because he provided it. But don't forget God's wonderful gift of, of just being with you, next to you, for you, alongside you, under you, and all the other prepositions that you could use to show God's presence in your life. I'm not putting you down. I'm lifting you up so that you look at words a second or third time. This much is true. We never outgrow our need for prayer. Why? I think it was a good day at week. It was a good week. Because God was with you, Pastor. We never outgrow our need for prayer. Why is it that we still... <laughs> I'm, I want to use the word need. Well, Why do we still pray? I was going to say we're, um, we're not perfect creatures in this world, unfortunately. So there are certainly uh, many things to ask for. And the biggest one is probably forgiveness on a regular basis. Uh, that we need uh -huh. yeah. to, to know that, you know, it's, it's a call for why we need Jesus. Absolutely. What, what other reasons can you give that we will go on praying until we see his face? And All right. There's an interruption while we, uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, that's another mystery. Well, I mean, at the beginning of our lesson, we had lots of prayers for many needs of, um, of people that have health needs, uh, job needs, um, protection needs, school needs. Um, so there are, I guess, so just so many needs in this world that we see that we call upon him to help us with uh, on a daily basis um, also. Give us our daily bread, you know, place food on the table and shelter and protect us from storms. Daily bread. Also praise, prayer in praise. Praise, yes. Yeah, praise. Thank you, Chris, for reminding us to praise God from whom, how many blessings? All of them flow. Yeah. And we heard this past week for prayer and how fortunate and uh, the, the, the words were there. And I thought so it was very good to hear and, and how fortunate we are still able to uh, the love of Christ. The love of Christ surrounds us. Yes, Pastor. Yeah. Look how many prayers. I was, I was, uh, I was cheering. Cheering. Cheering, yes. Well, you were cheering through the prayers. Well, I, I was doing both. I was doing, doing both. Look how many prayers. And, and, and how fortunate we are that we can still pray pray as long as you are alive pastor you will be praying mm. that's why we never outgrow our need for prayer and you know many hymns have the idea of prayer in them well how dependent are we on God, which of our needs can we obtain without God? The obvious answer is none of none. our needs, all right? We're totally dependent on him. And when we pray, we can recognize that and name that, and that's part uh, of our, our praise, isn't it, Chris? We praise him that we have been provided for. I think he's provided for me since I was a wee baby because I think I've told you the story. My mother had to give me up at three weeks old because of after birth psychosis type stuff. Oh. And uh, to get through that for her, now I look on it as her having to get through it, and I just survived, but it was just, just amazing. And I know God was with me the whole time, even though I was just a baby. You, you couldn't even ask, and yet he provided. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. hmm. Without his many, many promises to hear, we might doubt. There are many people who would like to pray, but they doubt that God hears. Mm -hmm. The relationship between father and child is not in their hearts. And so they can't go up and sit on daddy's lap and say, daddy, could I have? They would like to, but they doubt that God hears or that if he hears, he would ever answer. It's a very difficult place to be spiritually. I always say to people who have trouble praying, 
when you have trouble praying, <coughs> ask God for help in praying. <laughs> yeah. uh, there's a little trick there because when they're asking, they're believing that he will answer that prayer. And one of my joys of being a pastor is to say to people that God is listening. Amen. He's not Alexa. <laughs> Alexa hears some of what you say if you have it plugged in, but God hears, hears everything you say, even in your heart. Without as many promises to hear, we might doubt, will anyone listen? Will anyone help? St. Augustine said, man is a beggar before God. You may not like that word beggar, but Luther said it too at the end of his life. We are beggars. It is true. Many in our world continue to beg and grope after God, not knowing or believing or trusting in him. And the great example of that in the New Testament is the Athenians that Paul addressed in Acts chapter 17. Maybe you remember that passage. Uh, I have it here. St. Paul is speaking in the middle of the Areopagus, that means the marketplace. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by man, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. And he made from one every nation of men to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their habitation, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel after him and find him. Yet he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, even as some of your poets have said. He spoke to people who didn't know the true God about that true God. Things uh, didn't go real well for Paul in Athens. He had to get out of town eventually because his enemies were stirring up riots against him. Some things never change. <laughs> but getting away from Paul, when they, when the people he addressed, the people who lived in Athens, didn't know the true God, he proclaimed that God to them, the creator of everything who didn't need for them to give him anything. I heard a stewardship message a long time ago, and it was shocking <laughs> because the pastor said, the Lord doesn't need your money. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, a part of the people were rejoicing to hear that. <laughs> but it is for you to make an offering to God to take care of the spread of the gospel here and in other places. But we know him, we call God Father. The scriptures invite and incite us to pray. I have six passages. Um, Judy and Evelyn and Chris, would you each take two of them in any rotation you like, starting with, uh, I guess, uh, that rotation, uh, Judy, Evelyn, and Chris. Okay. One, two, three, and then four, five, six, uh, we'll do the same. Go okay. ahead, Judy. 
uh, Jesus, uh, number one, Jesus, pray so that you will not fall into temptation, Matthew 26, 41. Number two, pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Pray also for me that whatever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mysteries of the gospel. Ephesians 6, 18 to 20. Paul said, pray for me. Okay, now Evelyn, the next two. The early Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Acts 2, 42. James 5, 16, literal translation. Confess therefore to one another the sins and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Much prevails, strong and have power. The prayer of a righteous person, energized, made effective by God. Now if you go and read that, <laughs> any of the other translations, you won't get the fullness uh, of, the, of the Greek. And that's why I I gave you the literal translation. Okay, and then uh, Chris on five and six. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. 1 Timothy 2, 8. Okay, there's one of the places where there is a posture, lifting holy hands, mm. a posture of prayer. Yeah. And then finally, Chris on uh, six. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. 1 Peter 4, 7. So there is a, a way to go to God, and you see the humility embedded in those words. So here are six passages, and there are many, many more in the Bible that invite and incite us to pray. Uh, we need to be incited. <laughs> That's, that can be a good word. Mm -hmm. Not incited to evil, but incited to do good. And one of the things that believers do is talk to their Father in heaven. So what is God-pleasing prayer? Let's sum it up in four phrases, okay? God-pleasing prayer is a response of a believer to the grace of God freely given in his Son, Jesus Christ. The response that we make to God because we believe and we believe that we have been given this faith by the grace of God, and it came to us as a gift. When you say freely given, you're really being a little bit redundant, but redundancy is good because it enforces the meaning. Freely given, that's what grace means. So we have this as a gift, and we respond as believers, and we pray. Now this Jesus, this God made flesh, this is the one by whom and through whom alone we sinners are able to stand in God's presence and hope to be heard. We, we hear and we respond and we hope to be heard. And the word hope is not, oh, I hope so. Our hope is a certain hope. I hope that word didn't throw you. I could say, and know we are heard. All right. Sometimes the editing goes on in the midst of everything. So do you have any closing thoughts about prayer or... Uh, we, we're at, at about 50 minutes right now, and that will be uh, uh, as far as we can get today, because after this, it's a, a new subject. 
I think it's sad that we're not teaching prayer in school for how young children, because when I went to school, you did it every morning. I mean, you said the Lord's Prayer. But now, um, these children, now, I, you know, I know there's controversy there, but, but they're, they're at a loss of knowing that, that um, peace, or at least, uh, hopefully, you know, then it's, it's just really sad. Well, I, uh, yeah. go ahead. I was going to say, I like Pastor Julius a while back in one of his sermons, used the word faith, and then he used it as an acronym. F was uh, forward. Uh, was it forward all issues to heaven? Oh. Um, which was um, a good way of pointing, you know, we should pray. And whenever we have issues and problems to uh, wow. you know, not be afraid to uh, call on Jesus or to give thanks. Uh, some of those issues. You know, but this happened to use the word issue, so that generally means more that there are problems and concerns that we might have in our life. But it was uh, an acronym I had never heard of before, and it was was I thought it was a good little acronym. Thank you for sharing that. Forward all issues to heaven. Yes. F A I T H. You can write that down. Forward all issues to heaven. It helps you remember it. Mm -hmm. Let me close with a brief prayer then. And um, you can uh, stay and talk for a while if, if you're able and you'd like to. Lord God, grant uh, that what we have taught is true according to your word and your word alone, which is the source of what we know and believe about you, your son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, whom you have given to us. Grant that we will continue to pray in faith without doubts through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you next time.